Well, hey friends, and welcome back. If you've been around here for a while, you probably know that I love to travel. I love visiting new places, experiencing new cultures, and it really does just fill me up with so much joy and appreciation for this incredible world that we live in. And I'm so excited. I'm actually currently in the midst of planning an upcoming trip that we'll be going on to New Zealand. So I thought it might be fun to take you along and show you how I plan for travel. And there really is so much to cover here, but this is going to be fun. So if you haven't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button below and let's get started. When it comes to planning travel, the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is where are we going to go? But if you're anything like me, there might be half a dozen different places that you want to travel to. And so something that I like to do is just to enter into travel planning with an open mind. I have a running wish list of different countries that I'd love to visit one day. And what I've been doing for the past few years is just slowly crossing countries off of that wish list as I visited them. The so last year when I visited Greece and Italy, those were two countries that were at the very top of my list. But then other countries that have been on there for a while now are Ireland, Scotland, New Zealand, Australia, Peru, South Africa, and the list goes on. And so personally, I just love entering into travel planning with an open mind because it really allows me to be able to take advantage of any deals or opportunities that might arise, which spoiler alert absolutely happened when we planned our trip to New Zealand, but I'll get into that more when we talk about the flights. Budget is another huge factor that you want to take into account before booking anything. And personally, when it comes to planning for travel, I'm not the type of person who likes to have a plan for how I'm going to spend every single dollar on a trip. But that being said, I do think it's really important to have a budget range that you're going to work within. And it's so important to know what that range is before you book anything, because that's going to impact where you can go and what you'll do. And so a practical example of this is one country that I've always wanted to visit is Australia. And so a couple months ago, just out of curiosity, I started looking and trying to figure out how much flights would cost to that country. And immediately my mind was just blown. The tickets were three to $5,000 each. And so knowing my budget and what I like to spend on travel, I immediately just said, heck no, we're not going to be doing that, at least not at that price. And so when it comes to flights, think through what price range are you comfortable with? Is it $500 a ticket? Is it a thousand? Is it 1500 or more? What is that comfortable range for you? And the same thing goes for accommodations, for food, for activities. Again, it's really important that you clearly outline what dollar range you're comfortable spending on the trip. So try to create a general budget. And then what I'd encourage you to do is just to add in some wiggle room there. You never know what unexpected opportunities or expenses might come up while you're gone so it's really helpful to have a bit of margin built in and one quick pro tip here is to check the exchange rates of the country that you're planning on visiting depending on what that is when you travel you might either be able to enjoy the benefits of your dollar going a bit further or needing to pay a little bit more but either way it's important to factor that in unfortunately we're getting lucky in traveling to New Zealand right now the American dollar is a bit stronger than the New Zealand dollar so we're going to take advantage of our dollars going a bit further. Now granted, things are still pretty expensive in New Zealand, but every little bit helps. Then the last important thing that you'll want to consider before making any hard plans is to pick a time frame for your travel. In most countries, there's going to be a peak season and an off season for travel. And quite often that's going to be in the summer months, but it also isn't necessarily. If you're wanting to go skiing in the Alps, the peak season for that is going to be in the winter. And the same might be true if you're visiting a Caribbean destination. And so whether you're wanting to visit in the peak season or the off season, it's just important to know the pros and cons of each because that's going to play a huge role in what the weather is going to be like while you're there, how busy it is, and how much it will cost as well. If you're traveling during the peak season, you probably will be able to take advantage of some beautiful weather. But at the same time, you'll likely be paying top dollar for anything that you do, and everything is likely to be more crowded. And then you can almost reverse that for off-peak time, so it's really important to consider, okay, what's the most important to you? And so personally, something that I try to do is to travel in the months adjoining the peak season. They're often called the shoulder months, and in my opinion, they really do strike that perfect balance where the weather is still going to be good for you, but it's often going to be less crowded and a bit more affordable. And this is something that we've tried to take advantage of for a New Zealand trip. New Zealand is in the Southern Hemisphere, so our winter is actually their summer. And so what we've tried to do by planning our trip in November is to take advantage of the beautiful late spring weather that they experience in New Zealand. All right, but then with all of those preliminary decisions out of the way, it's finally time to start booking everything. 
Personally, when it comes to booking travel, I always like to start with booking my flights. That way I can know the exact dates and times that we'll need accommodation and transportation options. And when it comes to booking flights, Google is really my default option. Google's search engine really is unrivaled, so it's a really fast and easy way to find exactly what you need. So when it comes to booking a trip, I'll usually just start by putting in my home airport and the destination that I'm wanting to fly to. So right here we have Charlotte to New Zealand. Then I'll just click right here to more destinations. And it's just going to auto-populate with some arbitrary dates and airport destinations. You can refine your search from there. So say you want to be gone from November 15th to the 30th. We can put that in and that will automatically update the prices and I can see that Auckland is by far the most affordable option for us to fly into. Now, something that I like to do once I've narrowed down what my final airport destination is going to be is to check the dates on either side to see if I might be able to get a bit of a better deal. And there are two easy ways that you can do this. First, if you just come to this little calendar icon right here, it's going to have a range of dates available to you. So just at a glance here, I can easily see that if I left on Sunday rather than Tuesday, day, I could immediately save almost $300. And if I was okay with cutting my trip a bit shorter, I could return that Saturday and save nearly $600. So that's one way you can do it. And I would say if you have a bit more flexibility with your schedule, it's probably my preferred way you can do it. But there is another great option if you're working with a bit more of a specific timeline, and that's to come right here to the date grid. And essentially what this grid does is it shows you, okay, if you change your departure or return date by up to three days, here's how much you could stand to save. So looking at this graph, I can easily see if I depart two days sooner and return one day later, I can quickly save $400. Both of those tools are so useful. I use them all the time, especially when there's a specific destination I'm wanting to travel to. But if you are a bit more flexible with your travel planning, then I want to let you in on a couple of the secret tools that I like to use. And those are Scott's Cheap Flights and Fairdrop. They're both email subscriptions with an adjoining website, and I love them because they send you customized flight deals for all over over the world. And so once a day or once every few days, I'll just get an email that says, okay, hey, there's this flight deal that we found from your home airport to whatever this fun destination is from around the world. That's actually how we booked our flights to Greece last year, as well as New Zealand this year. Last year, I was able to find tickets to Greece that were less than $500. And this year I found tickets to New Zealand for less than 900, which is just absolutely incredible. So I highly recommend both of those as resources. All you need to do is create an account, put in in your home airport, and then you'll start receiving flight deals right away. And just to give you a couple of examples of what this could possibly look like, in the past week, I've been sent flight deals to Scotland for less than $500, to Paris for less than $600, and to Antigua for less than $400. And given that we already have some pretty significant travel planned in the next few months, we probably won't be taking advantage of any of those, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a taste of what it can look like. Okay, but then once the flights are booked, I like to take a quick pause before booking anything else to get some inspiration and ideas for what I want my trip to look like. I'll read articles and blog posts, check out TripAdvisor, and watch as many travel vlogs for the destination as I can find. And my goal in all of that is just to get as much inspiration as I can for where in the country we want to visit, what we want to do, any experiences that we want to have, or specific places we want to go. And this part is important because whenever you visit a new place, there's going to be a million options for different things that you can do. So it's helpful just to get an idea for what's out there and then to start slowly narrowing down your vision for the trip. Do you want to spend more time in the city or the country? Do you want to visit multiple locations or just one? Are you wanting to make this trip more about the beach, the mountains, or maybe both? Would you rather this trip be more about relaxation or have it filled with adventure? And those are just a couple questions. Obviously there are so many more that you can use to just get a better idea of what you want to get out of this trip. And that's really where getting inspiration can be helpful because they can help you to form a clearer picture. And that is exactly the process that I've been going through in planning our trip to New Zealand. I knew that the country was gorgeous, but apart from that, I didn't know any of the specifics. And so for the past few weeks, I've been reading dozens of blog posts and articles, watching lots of YouTube videos. Actually, I want to give a quick shout out to Daniger and Stacy's YouTube channel. They have so many incredible New Zealand travel vlogs on their channel and I've gotten a ton of ideas from them. But essentially, I've just been taking in all of this information and from there, tried to narrow down the list of places that I wanted to visit into something that would make for a realistic 10-day itinerary to the South Island of New Zealand. And what we ended up with was that we wanted to fly into Christchurch, 
to spend a few nights in Lake Tekapo, a few nights in Queenstown, to do a crazy fun adventure near Te Anu, I think I'm saying that right, and then to fly out of Queenstown. And at this point, that's really as detailed as you need to get. You just need a general concept of where you're going to be, at what time, so you can move on to booking accommodations and transportation. All right, let's talk accommodation. Where will you be staying on this trip? Generally, when I'm traveling, the two options that I like to consider are hotels and Airbnbs. If you are on more of a budget, hostels and couch surfing can be good options too, although I personally will say I don't have a ton of experience with them. And so for me, Airbnb is usually my go-to option. I just love how you can find some really unique stays in the greatest of locations. I mean, last year when we were in Florence, we stayed at an Airbnb that was literally in the heart of the city. We opened our doors and Palazzo Vecchio, which is one of the highlights of the city, was right on our doorstep. And I think we may have actually shared a wall with the Uffizi Gallery too. It was the perfect location. And so personally, I have had some amazing experiences with Airbnb, but depending on where you're staying, hotels or resorts could be great options as well. And for our trip to New Zealand, we found some more great Airbnbs that I cannot wait to see in person. When it comes to booking what places we're going to stay, the factors that I try to keep in mind are the location, the price, and the general vibes. What that balance looks like for me might be different than it is for you, but just try to think about, okay, what do I really value about in the place that I'm staying? Is it what the actual place looks like? Is it where it's located or is it the price? Or maybe a combination of the three. For me, it is a combination, but I definitely weigh the location a bit more than some of the other factors. And so for example, when we visit Lake Tekapo, the lake itself is the attraction. And so we've picked a location that is directly on the lake. Now there were several more aesthetic accommodation options nearby, but in this case, we decided that the location location was more important to us than what the place actually looked like. Within reason, of course. It is still a nice place, just not decorated exactly to my taste. And so that's a great example of how often you want to have all three, but it isn't always a possibility. So you need to figure out, okay, what is the most important to you? Another little pro tip here, and this is one that I cannot stress enough, and that's to read the reviews. Whether it's a hotel, an Airbnb, wherever you're planning to stay, read the reviews of the location before you make your reservation. That rhymed a bit, I didn't mean it to, but hopefully that helps you to remember. This is so crucial to make sure that you don't get blindsided and you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. I have had some of the best travel experiences due to accommodations and I have also had some of the worst. So it's really important that you do your due diligence. Now often I'll only stay at places, whether it's a hotel or an Airbnb these days, that have at least 10 positive reviews. Just trust me on this one, this is one of those things that can make a huge difference. Okay, so we've got our flights, our accommodations taken care of, and next we need to consider transportation. You need to have a plan for how you're going to get from the airport to your destination. Will you take a taxi, an Uber, a Lyft? What are the options as far as that goes in the country that you're going to be visiting? It's important that you know that ahead of time. And then also, if you're planning on visiting multiple locations in the country that you're visiting, how will you get to each of those? Will you need to take a train or a ferry? Do you need to rent a car? Depending on where you're traveling to, all of those can be on the table. Certain locations, certain countries are much more car friendly than others. In the United States, you almost need one, whereas in Europe, you can probably get away without one. And so it's really important that you know that going in. And this is really where drawing from any blog posts you may have read or travel vlogs you may have watched can be really helpful. And so from what I've read, renting a car while we're in New Zealand shouldn't be too much of an issue. Road trips are actually a pretty common way of experiencing New Zealand for the first time. And so we have decided to rent a car. And we found that it wasn't even an issue at all to pick it up in one city and drop it off in another. So we definitely got lucky there. While there can be complications with driving a car in a foreign country, having a car while you're traveling really does make figuring out transportation a whole lot easier. That being said, in many locations, it certainly isn't necessary. When we went to Greece and Italy last year, we did the vast majority of both of those trips with no vehicle. Once you've got all the big stuff booked, it's not over. In fact, this is where the fun really begins. So next, I want to walk you through a number of smaller but still extremely important factors that you'll want to consider. Making sure that all of your documents are prepped and ready to go is one of the most important things that you'll need to do before leaving. So first, check your passport. 
Make sure that it won't expire before you leave. Once you have your flight deals, make sure those are either printed out or saved somewhere where you can easily reference them. Look into visas. Are you going to need one to visit your destination? In most of the countries I visited where visas are required, it isn't a super complicated process, but it's something that you need to do before leaving for your trip. And then depending on where you're going, you might also need an international driving permit as well. We did rent a car for one day when we were in Greece last year. And so for that, Christopher needed to show an international driving permit. And if that's something that you've never heard of before, I hadn't before our trip, I'll link to some details in the description box below. And then another big one that you might run into is immunization records. Many countries require records of various immunizations and you might be required to show proof of those. So for example, when I was traveling to Uganda a few years ago, when I entered the country, they required that I showed proof that I'd received the yellow fever shot. So it's important to make sure that you're aware of and up to date with any immunizations that the country you're visiting might require. And if you're anything like me, getting your document in order and figuring out all of these details might be the most monotonous part of planning your travel. However, all of this is absolutely essential and it can save you so many headaches and a lot of heartache when you arrive at your final destination. Okay, let's talk about money. How will you be paying for everything on your trip? And as much as possible when traveling, I try to use cash as little as possible. And instead, we'll primarily use a foreign transaction fee free credit card. The one I have is the Capital One Venture X credit card, and it is an amazing card for travel. Not only does it have zero foreign transaction fees, but it also has a number of great perks for frequent travelers. Whether you choose to use that card or another though, I highly recommend either getting a card with a zero foreign transaction fee or having a plan to exchange your money into the currency of the country that you're visiting. And if you do choose to go with the exchanging currency route, I definitely recommend checking out the rates at your local bank or credit union. Often this will be a lot better than if you were to try to do it at an airport. Okay, and then two quick tips here. Number one is to have a backup plan. When we were in Italy last year, before we got our travel credit card, we basically just brought one credit card to the country. And while we were there, it just stopped working for no reason. And so we had to get on the phone with our credit card company. We were talking with them for several hours and it was a really scary situation. Fortunately, we did eventually get it all figured out, but if I can offer a tip to you, it's just to have a backup plan in place so that you're not left in the position that we were. That was actually what pushed us over the edge of finally deciding to get the Venture X card. And then tip number two is more of a reminder, but it's just to make sure that you notify your bank of upcoming travel. That way they're aware of what's going on and they won't accidentally flag your card for identity theft, which if you're connecting the dots there wasn't actually what the issue was with our card while we were in Italy, but that easily could have happened had we not notified them of travel. Okay, let's talk about language. Is English the primary language of the country that you're planning on visiting? If not, I definitely recommend trying to learn some bits of the language of the country before you go. A little bit really does go such a long way. Not only does it help to form a good impression, but it can also be helpful in a pinch. Phrases like hello, thank you, excuse me, where's the bathroom, and maybe even your coffee order can all be great to know. And then one absolutely life-saving tool that I'll mention here is the Google Translate app. It is so helpful for reading signs, reading menus, and finding the words that you need to communicate. This is something that I really think that I just could not have gotten by while we were in Greece with it. And this is another area where it's going to be a bit easier for us in New Zealand since everyone there speaks English. Calling, texting, and using data is something that we do on a daily basis. However, that can look really different when we enter foreign countries. And unless you already have an international phone plan, it's going to be important that you plan ahead for this. And one of the easiest ways that you can ensure that you have data while you're traveling is just to buy a prepaid SIM card that you'll be able to pick up at the airport at your destination. And these are typically fairly affordable and they can help make sure that you can use your phone freely throughout the trip. Now, if you do tend to travel a bit more frequently and live in the United States, something that you can look into is what I have. It's the T-Mobile Max or Magenta plan. And it's going to give you free free unlimited 2G data in over 200 countries. Now caveat with this, I will say it's 2G. So the data that you're getting is going to be slow, but it works and it's unlimited. So if you're fine with relying mostly on Wi-Fi and only using your data for things like navigation or basic web services, it can be a great option. And just one other quick note with this one is depending on what country you're traveling to, there might be other options available. So just do a bit of research with this one. Okay, and now for some of the fun stuff. It's time to take that general itinerary and start getting specific. 
And a great place to start is to figure out what are the events and activities that you want to experience. Figure out what the must-see places and attractions are for you, decide what day you'll be visiting them, and then book them ahead, especially if they're more popular. That way you can avoid the disappointment of getting to a place only to discover all the tickets are sold out for the day you are planning to visit. And this is something that I've done as we planned our trip to New Zealand. Visiting Milford Sound was absolutely at the top of my list of things that I wanted to do. So one of the first things that we did once we got our plane tickets was to book an overnight cruise in Milford Sound. I mean, I've just seen pictures and videos at this point, but it looks absolutely incredible. Definitely go back to the research that you've done already as you plan this out. I really have found just being able to draw on the experiences and reviews of others to be incredibly helpful. Okay, I know we've covered a lot already. I promise we are getting to the end here, but another big thing that you'll want to consider is food. Something I always love to do is to figure out if there are any fun traditional foods or drinks that you should try while you visit. So when we went to Greece, trying baklava was high on my list, and I discovered that I absolutely love a Fredo cappuccino. And in Italy, you know I had to get my hands on some pasta. So figuring out any fun traditional foods you might want to try can be a great place to start. But then also, one of the big things that I like to do when planning food for a trip is just to give myself options. So often I won't book anything ahead of time just so I can keep things flexible from day to day. But I do like to look up some cool options in the cities we'll be visiting ahead of time so that when it comes time to eat, we're not scrambling trying to find a place at the last minute. And just like with booking accommodations, I'm big on reading the reviews of the different restaurants that we're planning on visiting. I really feel like you can learn a lot from them and get a good feeling for whether or not a specific restaurant would be a good fit for your travel crew. One quick tip for selecting great restaurants while you're traveling is just to try getting off the beaten track of it. In my experience, super touristy areas don't usually have the best food. Sometimes they can, but I definitely say they're the exception, not the rule. So do your research. Again, just like booking accommodations, reading the reviews is so important. Just because the food looks good in images doesn't necessarily mean it's going to taste the same way. All right, but now it's time to bring it all together and to get your ducks in a row. At this point, you probably have a ton of information stored in loads of different places. Whether that's email confirmations, open tabs, notes on your phone, Google Docs, and maybe a variety of other things as well, it's finally time to bring it all together. And the first thing that I like to do is to put all of the confirmation emails that I've received into a folder and title that folder just the name of the location you're going to. That way, everything will be easy to find. So I've already created our New Zealand folder and as we book more and more things, we'll just add to that list. Okay, the next, I like to create a bit of an information hub. And you can do this in a Google Doc or an Apple Note. Personally, Apple Notes is my go-to, so I'll be doing it in there. But I just like to begin by entering my flight information at the top of my page. I'll make a note of when each flight departs and lands and include any other important details in there. And then right below that, I'll create a general itinerary that's just kind of a bird's eye overview of our entire trip. And that will just include where we'll be staying each night, as well as the one to two big big activities that we're planning on that day. And a quick side note, I always try to make sure we never plan more than a couple of big activities each day. That way we don't overpack our schedule. But then after that general itinerary and usually closer to our actual date of travel, I'll often include a screenshot of the weather forecast for our trip. And that's just helpful to reference as I pack and plan. And then last but not least, I like to include a more specific daily breakdown of where we're going to be staying, what we'll be doing each day. And I'll also include the recommendations for different food options that I've gathered there too. For me at least, this is just a way of planning that I found works really well. It helps to make sure that we always have something to do each day, but there's also flexibility so that if we want to go on a random adventure, we can. That's what I've done for most of our travels in the past and it tends to work pretty well. <laughs> And then the final thing to do is to start packing. And this really could be an entire video all on its own. And actually, let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that. But just a few big things to keep in mind as you pack are to check the weather of the location you'll be visiting, to see if there are any dress codes that you'll need to follow, whether that's dressing up or covering up for a specific location, and to consider any activities that you have planned, whether that's hiking, going to the beach, or anything else. And then just a quick tip and reminder with this one is to figure out if you'll need any travel adapters for the country that you'll be visiting. It's just 
one of those small but important details that it's easy to forget. And then just one final piece of advice for packing, but then also just generally too, is to ask for recommendations, advice, and ideas from people who either might live there or who you might know who've traveled to that country. You really can get some of the best recommendations and ideas from people who've been there before. All right, well, we did it. We made it to the end. And I know that this was a lot, but I really hope that it was helpful for you and that whether you're planning a trip to a new country or still in the brainstorming stage, that it can give you some tips and inspiration as you go. And then really quick, I just wanted to encourage you. I know that this can sometimes feel a bit overwhelming, but it can also be a ton of fun too. Just take it one step at a time and I know you've got this. And if you do have any questions that I didn't address here, just comment them below and I'll try to answer as many as I can. But then also too, if you have any travel tips that I didn't mention here, or you have some fun recommendations for New Zealand, I would love to hear about them. So again, leave those in the comments. And as always, it would mean so much to me if you would give this video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you haven't already, and make sure that you're following along on Instagram too to get real-time updates of all our adventures. I will probably vlog while I'm in New Zealand, but that won't be live until I'm back. I would love to connect with you there, but until next time, friends, and thank you all so, so much for watching, and happy travels.